Uh, so my name is Sean Dowd. I'm with Alex Partners, and we're kicking off our inaugural interview series with senior legal executives. And we're joined by Scott Corrigan of Standard Chartered Bank. And uh, it's our great pleasure to have him on our first of many of these interviews. And we're going to be asking a series of questions and having a conversation today. Uh, Scott, why don't you kick us off by telling us a little bit about you and about the bank? Sure. Um, my name is Scott Corrigan. I am in the legal department at Standard Chartered. I am the global head of disputes and government investigations. Standard Chartered is a multinational bank. We operate in over 50 markets throughout the world, and um, we have our fair share of legal and regulatory issues, which is what I think you want to speak with me about today, Sean. Yes, yes. You're an ideal first guest. Um, so <laughs> let's dive right into it. Um, there's a lot of things that probably keep you awake at night. What tops your worry list? right now in today's operating environment? Well, you're right, Sean. Obviously, there are a lot of um, items that I would say are priorities. However, if I have to pick one, it's data and data man management. And there are a variety of items that I can list under that. I won't capture them all in the short period of time that we have. To begin with, though, it's identifying and inventorying all of our business data. That's, that's the first step that we have to take. We then have to be able to readily, and when I say readily, I mean promptly and completely access that data. We have to use our data in a responsible way, responsible in terms of customer privacy, um, responsible in terms of the use to which we put data. And related to that is complying with the data privacy laws in all of the various jurisdictions in which we operate. There's also the question of protecting our data. I mean, we're, we're in an environment where hacking and cyber attacks on corporations, including banks, is, is ever escalating. And so our ability to protect our data is paramount as well. Yeah, no, that's totally understandable. I mean, how many, how many clients does the bank have? That may be a hard question to answer, but give, give, give me an idea of the magnitude of challenge you have when it comes to data. Well, it, it's you know tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of clients and we're talking about different types of clients in different jurisdictions and spread across jurisdictions. We might have a global multinational client who we're banking in many jurisdictions. We have touch points with them in many jurisdictions. And then that spans down to an individual retail client who we're banking only in a particular market and who may have a checking and savings account with us. Um, so it, it varies. I mean, it's a, across the board in terms of size and touch points. I can see why that would top your worry list. Um, you alluded not only to litigation risk, but regulatory risk as well when you cited privacy uh, regulations around the world. What can you can you speak to what today's uh, current regulatory environment um, presents? to you in terms of challenges, where the biggest challenges are? Well, I, I think the biggest challenges that we face currently may be in regimes where individuals have a right to obtain their data. So all of the data that we may have pertaining to a particular client in certain jurisdictions, they're entitled to request that and in most circumstances, we have to produce that data to the client. And that goes back to the point I was making about being able to identify inventory and access our data. In order to respond to those requests, 
for for client data from clients directly or from regulators or from other counterparties who have um, have the ability to request and lawfully obtain data from us. That's the challenge. Uh, and, and I mentioned that earlier, being able to identify and retrieve data when it's requested. Yeah, yeah. So you've also mentioned um, various jurisdictions. Since you're a large global bank and you've been around a long time, you operate around the world. Um, these days, what's the most challenging jurisdiction that you're operating in? So the most challenging jurisdiction that we operate in, and I, and I wouldn't say this is necessarily from a, a data perspective, although it relates to data, and you may find this a surprise given uh, my accent. Um, I am a U.S. citizen. I'm, I'm based in our London office, but I'm a U.S. citizen. And despite the fact that the jurisdiction I'm about to mention, um, I'm a big fan of the rule of law. It's a very commercially attractive place to operate. However, from a regulatory perspective, the United States is the most challenging for a, for a bank, a financial institution. That's for a number of reasons. Uh, one is the number of different banking regulators that play in the United States financial services field. There are multiple banking regulators at the federal level. Then if you have a state charter and Standard Chartered has uh, multiple state licenses in the United States, you also have to deal with multiple state banking regulators. Then there are also what I term specialist regulators, such as the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, and others. And then there are also multiple regulators that play in what I'd call the security space. And the two federal ones, the two big federal ones, are the Securities Exchange Commission and the Commodities Futures and Trading Commission. And so it's, it's the sheer number of regulatory agencies that, that exist in the United States for a financial services institution that your number presents a, a great challenge. So you've got a lot of you've got a lot of prudential regulators. You've got a lot of people looking at you, and I'm sure there's at times uh, the challenges of facing parallel proceedings where you've got a number of different regulators looking at the same issue. So you have to you have to act as a traffic cop, and all of your people around these issues are trying to suss out. Who is who is looking at what and and where the the biggest liability pitfalls are if you don't answer the questions that they have? Well, that, that's absolutely absolutely right, Sean. And when we have parallel proceedings, generally in the U.S., it's not just two regulators; it's two or more regulators that that we're dealing with, and and a challenge that we face. And I, I'm not complaining about this. This is the the way. We operate in the U.S. And, and we do it, as do many other financial services institutions, other banks. But when something occurs that we want to tell our regulator, that we want to share with our regulator, we have to identify who are the right regulators to tell in the first instance. And generally, that in, in the U.S., in the first instance for us, that's going to be our prudential banking reg regulator. So that'll be the Federal Reserve. And it's with our New York branch, it would be the New York State Department of Financial Services. However, depending upon the issue, there are other regulators and potentially prosecutors who we will have to tell about particular issues when they arise. And then we also have our prudential banking regulator in the UK. Um, conduct regulator in the UK, and also depending upon the type of issue and, and how it presents, if it's cross-border, if it involves multiple jurisdictions, we have to think about notifying regulators outside of the UK. Yeah, wow. Your plate is pretty full of these things. But you are a regulated industry by definition. It, we, we are a regulated industry. We have the uh, good fortune of being able to have a license 
to engage in, in banking and in the business of banking. And with that privilege comes responsibility. And we have to own up to our responsibility and get it right. And identifying the correct regulators to communicate with about particular issues and then communicating with them effectively about those issues is our responsibility. We have to do that. Yeah. Yep. So we've talked a lot about data. Um, I think one of the major ways that we all work with data today is using technology. How, how have advances in technology um, changed your role as a senior legal executive? Well, today, whenever there's a discussion of technology, the elephant in the room is artificial intelligence. And so why don't I start there and, and talk about the ways in which, while at this point, artificial intelligence hasn't greatly changed the role of the in-house lawyer, I think we're on the cusp of seeing big changes for in-house legal departments. And that's going to occur um, in a number of ways. One way is the discussion about cost. A big part of the budget that lawyers manage in-house is the cost of outside counsel. The press and others are reporting that with AI, a lot of the legal tasks that are performed by human beings right now who bill for that time will be performed by artificial intelligence. So in the first instance, I think it's incumbent upon all in-house legal departments to figure out how they can effectively use artificial intelligence and if it can be used effectively to manage outside legal costs, because management is going to ask for that, and rightfully so, and ask about that. There are challenges with that, obviously, the use of artificial intelligence, and this does go back to data. Who is going to manage the data that's put into the particular artificial intelligence tool that's being utilized by either external counsel or in-house counsel? Currently, artificial intelligence can be used effectively in a number of ways. One way that it can be used very effectively is in due diligence when there's a defined data set and that defined data set is run through AI, that can be very effective. However, if the data set is uncontrolled, so for example, we've, we've heard the example, I think many have heard the example of a law firm that had the misfortune of asking chat GPT to write a brief to be filed in court with it. And chat GPT, unless set accordingly, uses an uncontrolled data set. And not only an uncontrolled data set runs the risk of hallucinating. And when I say hallucinating, what I mean by that is making things up and making up citations. So I think our artificial intelligence is going to change the way in which we operate and manage our, our matters. We're going to have to figure out, though, where it can be used correctly and effectively, where it shouldn't be used, and, and where it will be perilous to use it. And a big question that, that arises in, in that context is, is what data is going into the artificial intelligence. And then also having the ability to understand why the artificial intelligence comes up with whatever answer it provides. I need an in-house legal needs to be able to explain to multiple stakeholders, in-house management, regulators, counterparties, and others, why we're getting the answer that we're getting if we're using artificial intelligence. Right. Are you presently and currently using it internally? You, you talked about counsel, outside counsel, using it to contain costs, but are you using it currently at the bank? So the, the short answer is 
I'm not, on my team, we're not using it. We're not currently using artificial intelligence. And when I mention the ability of using artificial intelligence to contain costs, that's for us to use it to contain the amount of billings that we get from external counsel. That is, that is an opportunity that we in-house lawyers are going to be exploring and, and exploring it pretty quickly. Yeah, you know, I've heard this multiple times from people, both in, in-house and external counsel, where they've asked uh, for discrete tasks to be accomplished through AI, and it can be done within seconds and quite good. But I think we have to explore where the technology is and what it can do at this stage and stay on top of the advancements lest we we get a work product like that lawyer in new york who you referred to obliquely who had a bad surprise um <laughs> with his brief and the citations that were in fact uh hallucinatory if that's a word uh, I, I, th I think the word that is used is 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 hallucination when when ai makes right. something up and in a way, in, in the work that I do, litigation and government investigations, we've already been experimenting with the precursor to AI for many, many years. And that's the use of programs to do first level document review, right? Where we're using tools that have preset parameters and then a preset source of data to generate what are the relevant and responsive documents in a very large data set. So we've been using it there. I ex will continue to use that. And I anticipate that we'll be using AI in that space to provide more precise and faster outcomes. Yeah, no, that's, uh, it's well said. And I think you're, you're at the vanguard with, um, many other progressive firms in exploring how it can be used to uh, to help contain costs and how to do things better and faster. Um, so in the last couple of minutes, we're going to move away from business questions. Fun personal question. What's the best book that you've read recently? Well, well, the best book that I've read recently is not necessarily a fun book, but it was a very, a very uh, interesting and entertaining book, and and that's the Wager by David Graham. Uh, this is a nonfiction account about a 18th century British warship that shipwrecked on a small island off the coast of Patagonia. And look, it's a, it's a tale of survival, uh, uh, without ruining the pun, without spoiling it for everyone. Not everyone survives, but it is a tale of survival. And it's also instructive in that in an incredibly stressful situation, and I've never faced anything in my career as stressful as being stranded on a, on a uh, foreboding island. It, it's instructive in the sense of what people do and how they act in stressful situations and how leaders lead in stressful situations. And so while I can't apply directly what occurs in, in the book into my day-to-day -day, uh, work routine, I can learn from it in terms of leading a team in a, in a stressful situation, which we do face uh, occasionally in the work that we do. Terrific. So you're... Your leisure reading, you're linking it back to the captaining of the legal function at the bank. Um, I think that, that puts a nice uh, pin in this five question interview that we've had. Uh, Scott, I wanna thank you for your time and your insights today. I think um, you've given me things to think about and I'm sure our viewers who watch this will be uh, pondering some of the things you brought up as well.